On today's PropTech VC podcast, we have Paul Schulte. Paul Schulte is based in Singapore and is a government and corporate advisor, runs his own research firm, and published a great book recently of many books he's written, The Digital Transformation of Property in Greater China. I'm holding it up right here if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, otherwise, you can search for it online. So there is a lot of change happening in the world right now. And it looks like the change started many years ago. Uh, would love to sort of dive into um, what's going on in China and specifically what's the great theme here with regards to the US and where the US is in relation to China. There seems to be a race. Most people aren't aware of it. Uh, sort of set the context for us. So, so in 2014, uh, China made a couple of big decisions. Uh, it pretty much, you know, uh, threw the dice on a total technological uh, rebuild of China. Uh, because there was no there there, right? I mean, China only came to the party maybe, you know, 20 years ago. <clears throat> and so it didn't have that copper and massive tele telephonic uh, build out that Europe and America had, you know, throughout the 20th century. And so it was able to to build a lot of you know, new new technology from the ground up uh, because there was no there was no lobbyists, there was no provincial, state, local regulatory structures, there was no federal you know, bureaucracy, there was nothing. And so these companies that came to the fore, Alibaba and Tencent, back in 2000, 2002, by 2010, 2012, there was a, a sense that uh, a lot more could be done. And there was also a couple of other issues. One was that um, that Xi Jinping had been party secretary uh, in Hangzhou, in, in Zhejiang province for five years. And that was when, from like 2003 to 2008, that was when Jack Ma was building Alibaba. So he would undoubtedly have watched it very carefully. The second big thing was, you know, toward the middle of the teens, I think China realized that uh, there, was a, 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 there was a growing tension with America. And I think that uh, a blockchain-based technological solution to the currency struggle between China and America was it. And early, you know, very early thinkers uh, in the top of the Chinese government for their five-year plans was basically saying, look, let's um, build out blockchain. We think this is going to work. <clears throat> we think you can build a, a sort of an e-currency platform on top of it. And you can interact in goods and services with the rest of the world without using the dollar. And this is now called BSN, the Blockchain Service Network. And it was rolled out within the last you know, three to four months. When we look at where the US has come from, the US has gone through a lot. Uh, the US has been you know, part of many wars. We've got an opiate addiction problem. We've got a growing prison population problem. We've got school shootings happening. Um, and in your book and in other podcasts, you talk about how this is really um, created a big problem for America. It's been too busy fighting internal uh, strifes. And on the other hand, China's been pulling ahead. So talk us a bit about that as well. Well, that's right. And so so the the, the foreword of the book is written by David Lee. And David Lee is a you know a colleague of mine. We teach together. We just taught a course last week on the book at the university here uh, in Singapore. And, you know, David, David's warning was, you know, why did China lose out? Why, why was China in the dark ages in the first, uh, second, third industrial revolutions, right? The first one was sort of the, the steam engine, coal, you know, <laughs> in, in the 1800s. The second one was your electricity, telephone, car, airplane, uh, light bulb, right? And then the third one was sort of the 60s, 70s, you know, the computer and, you know, the Apollo project and so forth. And so, you know, China missed out because all during that time, China was in civil war. China was in civil war and it was fighting off colonial, uh, imperial aggression and occupation. Uh, and David says, when you're in, when you're engaged in civil war in, in, or profound civil discourse that that is that is ugly and, and hateful, you, you can miss out on these um, these technological revolutions. And David warns America that that may be happening right now. David lived in America in San Francisco for many many years. He knows America very well. And, and he's a Singaporean. And so um, he's just basically said in the forward of the book, America is in danger of, of, of missing out on, on uh, this new technological revolution in blockchain and, and crypto and, and the way in which uh, new currency structures are, are being born. So you have, you know, and, and, the, and then you have the four years of Trump, which was just, you know, sort of this, you know, weird, you know, sort of surreal dream, you know. And, and so so the Fed was not with the program. 
the uh, SEC was not with the program, the Treasury Department was not with the program, while China was building out uh, very, very expensive multi-billion dollar solutions for both the blockchain service network and also the People's Bank of China's um, e-currency. And, and when it was rolled out last summer, I, I will submit to you when it was rolled out last sort of spring, summer, uh, that was the beginning of this explosion in cryptocurrency prices. A lot of that was because of what China did. China basically said, hey, we're open for business. This is going to be crypto, blockchain-based, a new way of doing business with China. And we, we're going to accept up to 20 cryptocurrencies uh, it, uh, as, as a sort of um, on-ramps to the BSN. And that was like, whoa, this is not expected. So, so China really blew everybody away by how forward-looking it was, A, to have the blockchain service network, B, to offer crypto on-ramps for uh, the network uh, and C to be so aggressive about how it was going to be rolled out. And D, the PBOC cryptocurrency, the, the, the PBOC e currency, um, which was basically DCEP, uh, digital currency slash elect electronic payments. Uh, and so all that was basically rolled out in the last, you know, 20, 20, 24 weeks. Now you see a big FOMO moment. We have a huge fear of missing out. And every central bank is tripping over each other, trying to roll out something to respond to China. And that's what we're seeing in front of our eyes right now. How did we get here? A moment ago, it felt like U.S. firms had the upper hand. Uh, they were, and not just U.S., European firms too, were outsourcing everything to China. And, you know, the U.S. ultimately focused on its core innovation, IP, and the Chinese developed a reputation as copycats. Um, and, you know, it, it felt like the dynamics were completely in favor and, and it would just, you know, put China in a position where eventually as labor costs rise, you'll go to the Philippines, you'll go to India, you'll go to the next measure market. It, it, it seemed to have happened very quickly where suddenly China is now innovating and that's not what people expected. How did this happen? That's right. And I, I think I think the moment was, I, you know, I was uh, I, I invested in a, uh, a quantum uh, software uh, communication company in Washington, D.C. And I was talking to the guy who's a CEO, a very bright guy who has since gone to Amazon. And, and um, you know, this is what happened. I'm going to tell you what happened. Uh, what happened was China fired off a rocket uh, and put a satellite in space. And only after the satellite was in space did China disclose that not only was China capable of quantum communication technology, but it was doing a quantum uh, communication technology in the vacuum of space. And to give you a sense of how behind America was, um, America couldn't even do line of sight quantum communication, barely could do line of sight quantum communication. And so that was the freak out moment. Like, WTF, what is going on here? A, they didn't even know the rocket was being fired off. And B, you know, you didn't know that China was this far ahead in quantum communications. And as we all know, <clears throat> quantum communications is unbreakable. This made the NSA completely freak out and panic <laughs> because uh, this means, you know, the NSA can't get up your skirt and figure out everything. And so, you know, the NSA breaks every code on earth. And this is where we, you finally come up against one that's unbreakable. That was the, the Sputnik moment for America, uh, probably in uh, the middle of 2007, the summer of 2017. Is there is there too much arrogance? Is is that why you think we've ended up in this situation where, and you know, the situation is what it is, and it's you know every country has it has its strengths, um, or is it just? the law of big numbers. I mean, China has a massive population. Its middle class is bigger than our entire U.S. population. Um, they're turning out, in one way you could say, you know, China's turning out 5 million STEM candidates per year, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, right? Many of these people coming from some of the best universities, not just in China, but in the U.S. and Europe. And that's 10 times bigger than, you know, uh, the U.S. at 0.5 million. Is, is it because China's really invested in this or is it just a law of numbers? And the larger you are, the more ideas you're going to have and the more you're going to succeed. Or is there, in, is there actual infrastructure that's putting China where it is? Well, that's right. I mean, uh, you know, first of all, you know, uh, when you look back at China's history, China has, you know, ha has had periods of golden ages where they just invent everything in that period, right? China invented paper money. China invented, you know, um, uh, everything, cement, tar, construction materials, blood circulation, everything. <laughs> Over these periods of golden ages, surrounded by these terrible periods of dark ages and war and civil war. Uh, and, and that's the law of, of large numbers when 
it, it just becomes ungovernable and, and the place falls apart. And so, you know, right now China's in kind of a golden age and where the mojo is all in favor of, you know, confidence and success. And so I felt like when I was growing up in America in the 70s, I felt that in the 60s when I was a boy and going into, you know, like middle school, you know, America had that mojo. We could do anything, right? Right. China's kind of there right now and America's going through this terrible midlife crisis of all these things you mentioned earlier on. Is, is it too late for America? Do you think the, you know, frog is in boiling water and it, it's a bit too late now to jump out of it? Well, you know, funny, uh, the, the, you know, the old Christopher Hitchens, you know, uh, God bless him, uh, he passed away, but he was, you know, the British guy who wrote beautiful stuff about America. His, his greatest line ever was, America is the only country that constantly um, rediscovers its virginity. And, and so uh, America will rediscover its virginity again. It, it'll build up again. But I, I think it's in a dark period right now. I think, I, I think it's in a very dark political period right now. I think it's probably getting worse rather than better. Biden is giving a little bit of stability to, to the boat, but I, I think that it's going to be in for a very rough time. I think there is deep, deep societal fissures that, that are that are very deep, independent of, of, of the, the rancor in Washington D.C. and 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 so I, I think that. Um, Funny, I've been talking to a lot of people the last few days because a lot of weird things are happening in the last like 72 hours. I, I think that um, I, I really fear that America is sleepwalking into a conflict with China. This is what I'm starting to con conclude myself. And so not only does it have terrible rancor and it's kind of lost its way, but I think uh, it's the arrogance is, is causing a, a sleepwalking conflict with China, which I would not have said that a few months ago, but I think there's just a very dangerous hubris and arrogance that thinks that, you know, China can just be pushed around like America's been pushing around countries in the Middle East and, you know, Iran and, you know, Guatemala and Dominican Republic and Chile and Vietnam and, and all these other countries, you know, over the last several decades. China has never once had a single American soldier or any uh, naval base ever anywhere on its territory since its independence, and it doesn't want that. So right. it's not interested in that. It, it's not interested in being a... A, it's, it's not interested in an American garrison of any way, shape, or form. It's not going to happen, and America doesn't like that. And so, uh, but but what I've been talking about with American officials recently, and other people in the intelligence communities, and other people I deal with in, in governments in my work, I, I, I see America really biting off an awful lot. You know, the North Korean Peninsula is, is going to be defended. Taiwan is going to be defended. The South China Sea is going to be defended. The Indian Ocean is going to be defended. Well, you better figure out which one's important because you're committing so much that you're almost bound to um, fall into a conflict. And, you know, you're, I mean, China's not some backwater anymore. China's got very, you know, sharp teeth. And so I, I just hope that, that you know, um, uh, this, this, this sort of lunatic, um, uh, you know, jingoism toward China is, it can be toned down because I'm just afraid it's gonna, uh, they're gonna sleepwalk into a conflict. I'm, I'm very nervous about that. And, and sort of d define conflict, because in today's world, uh, conflict doesn't have to necessarily be physical. There can be a lot of uh, digital cybersecurity warfare going on, and it happens all the time. Um, <laughs> are you talking about an actual physical conflict here, or, or, or are you hinting more towards diplomatic uh, conflicts and sanctions and things that will hold both countries back? Uh, no, not at all. I, I, I was talking to uh, some officials today about this um, uh, in, in one of the NATO countries about this. And, you know, we were talking about kill switches, right? I mean, the, the next conflict's not going to, you don't have to fire a single shot, but the kill switches can destabilize and, and debilitate an economy through uh, cutting off refrigeration. Right. You can starve. You can starve a population by cutting off refrigeration, and electricity. Right. You can do it with transportation. You can do it with air, land, and sea transportation. All three at the same time. Air traffic control stations, electricity grids. You know, and, and both sides have zero-hour bots. You know that can cut off each other's oil supply, gas supply, electricity supply, refrigeration, <clears throat> transportation. Uh, navigation, uh, ship navigation. Th this is all there. It's all been right. It, it, it's already been installed, right? You, 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 you right? You, the, the cake's already been baked. You, you just got to have some negotiations to have both sides sort of pull back and uh, arrange for some sort of um, you know detente about how they're going to live with each other. Because I, I don't think China is very interested in being pushed around.